about um, getting different perspectives. And, and I'm not going to say that's easy, and we'll get to the challenges later, um, but that's an important area of work for us. Um, and the, the fourth area of work, which sort of we don't really classify as beneficiary feedback, but I think is important to acknowledge, which is the whole enormous portfolio of work around um, empowerment and accountability. And this is the work that we do with partner governments to strengthen the systems that they have to ensure um, that they are accountable and responsive to their citizens. So you see a lot of this work in, in governance programs and in basic service delivery. And so you have social audits and kind of feedback methodology there. So that's a lot of work being done there. Um, so yes, yeah, so I'm giving you kind of a big, broad picture of kind of how we're thinking about beneficiary feedback across the portfolio. Okay, thank you. Um, and can I just ask, as a, as a follow-up at this stage, so what, how, well, how long, just a practical thing, how long have you been doing this? Um, so there has been a, a person dedicated to beneficiary feedback since 2012. Okay, so quite recently. And what is, so what are you, so we've got three years behind you. So what are you learning so far? What, what, are, you, what are you finding? Good question, um, which actually leads me to something I forgot to mention in my opening remarks, which is that we've had one piece of work um, that was started back in 2012, actually, which is about learning about beneficiary feedback, um, which is a set of pilots um, that, we, that were started in 2012 with World Vision um, and part of what's now called UK Direct. Um, and this is a sort of a set of pilots that are with civil society organizations looking at different approaches to beneficiary feedback, um, looking at technology-based approaches, looking at different sort of open and closed kind of question systems. Um, and that's been going now since 2013 um, and in seven countries. No, seven pilots in six countries. Um, and it's really interesting that that work is now kind of, we're getting some good lessons there about how, how difficult it is, to be honest, to really integrate, you know, not just sort of beneficiary feedback as a nice to have, occasionally you go out and ask people, but as David said, to have it really be a systematic process. Um, and so that's a piece of work that we expect to be done next year, and we hope to get some good lessons out of that. Um, and attached to that, we have um, a group of civil society organizations that do come together on a regular basis talking about beneficiary feedback and sharing their lessons with the community. So that's in terms of the lesson learning that we're doing there. Things are coming through. And you know, it's largely about how, you know, how to deal with the challenges and how to, um, how to incentivize systems and, and, and how to encourage, um, encourage good practice in this area. So, yeah. so what are the big challenges then? Oh, uh, <laughs> yeah, no, there are. Out there. Yeah, no, there Scott. are. There are a lot of good, cha big challenges. Um, you know, I think one of them. <coughs> I mean, I think if if I go back to the big picture, I think one of the big challenges is really kind of shifting away from I think quantity to quality. Um, I think, and this is a point David made, sort of. You know, this issue around, you know, just collecting stories from people that in an extractive way so that you have three quotes in your annual report, you know, that that's not anything to do with genuine beneficiary feedback, but that's often kind of the knee-jerk reaction. But really kind of shifting it from that to, you know, the kind of how you get that data, how do you bring it into your into your management decisions, how do you make decisions on it, how do you communicate that back, all of that is really needs to be thought through um, and I think that's a, a big challenge <clears throat> about how you sort of create that larger system um, and for us as well I think related to that um, is about the trust and the partnership that's needed and I know we'll talk a little bit later about kind of evidence but I think you know there is a question about you know good beneficiary feedback can, can raise challenging findings um, and, and you need to have a trusting relationship in order to be open about that. And, and how do we incentivize that kind of relationship? And I think that's going back to what I was saying about the 37 rules. It's not something you can formally say or do. It's something that's quite, you know, it's about the relationships between, you know, implementing partners and, and their donors. And, and 
you know, we're still figuring out how do you do that? How do you get that? You know, do you strengthen those kinds of relationships so that the information that, that you're getting is, is genuine and can really help you make decisions rather than, you know, the incentives being that you need to have a good storyline because you want more funding, because you want to demonstrate success, and so you kind of, you know, you're always making it look good. So I think for me that's a kind of probably one of the biggest challenges to, um, to crack. So maybe I'll kind of stop there and okay. let David jump in on this one. Yeah. Yes, David, I mean, I'd be interested to know because you've been obviously, you know, work, developing this constituent feedback for a long time. So what have you learned from working with Diffid on this? I mean, what's, you know, what's emerging for you? Sure. Um, I wonder if this one works. Yeah. Um, so actually, I don't, I don't know that I can do any better than what Nina just did uh, in terms of these two key pieces. The one piece is actually developing a rigorous systematic practice, and it's new, and um, it's a challenge because it's new. I mean, all the usual things, people don't know how, um, and so on. And so organizations having to learn new muscles and build new muscles is a, is a challenging thing. Um, the, so the, this Partner Voice project that we're doing in Zambia, we're going to be huddling uh, after this session for a bit to talk about it. But it's just young. But I can already see that one of our big challenges is going to be getting sufficient mind share from the staff on the ground and the different staff. The leadership is totally there and is supporting it, including creating space for people to, to you know, use their discretion. But they have myriad voices screaming around them. And they're being pulled in 15 different directions. And we're basically saying, this will help you. But we haven't demonstrated it yet. It, it's not, it's a kind of a this will help you. It doesn't, it isn't helping them. At the moment, it's a more of a demand. So that's, I think that's one of the biggest challenges. And we see that again and again and again in all our work. And uh, the key to getting through it is, again, the leadership kind of keeping, the, keeping the, the, the drum beat going so that people eventually get to the point where they break through and incorporate it into their daily practice. But it's, it's, uh, that, I think that's one of the big ones. Um, there's a structural issue. I mean, Nina talked about the trust, how important trust is in partnership when you're working at power relationships across organization, funders, implementers, implementers, beneficiaries. Um, it's always a challenge to get to trust the process and to allow it to surface difficulties, conflicts, and then start to manage them in a new way. Uh, and that's, that's always a challenge. And um, I wanted to just say that I see this as kind of a structural issue that can be worked on, and it gets larger than just trust, but it also goes to uh, classic issues around accountability and, and demand. Um, when I started to get that this was powerful and in, important and missing in our practice, because I come out of the participatory development tradition in international development, and I spent my early years working with some of the pioneers of, of participatory development methodologies. So I was in the field doing that work and seeing how great it was, walking with communities, doing maps of assets and villages and things. And, um, and, and yet it never really landed in the, in, the, in the rigorous practice in the very organizations that facilitated this participatory development, which is why we went on to develop this methodology many years later. Um, it's kind of a problem that sat deep in my chest for 20 years, and when I didn't see it getting solved, I, I stepped out of what I was doing at the Aga Khan Foundation and started Keystone to try to develop methodology. But when I, when I was working on it, uh, someone said to me, you know, David, has any organization solved this problem? And I thought, I don't know. And he said, well, why don't you take a look at the business sector? You sound an awful lot like these customer satisfaction guys that I know. This was a guy who was a professor at the Stanford Business School. So I said, OK, you know, I've never had any real interaction with the for-profit world, but I said, I'll give it a shot. And I went and met some of the people in that industry. And lo and behold, they've got techniques for listening to the people they serve. And they landed in rigorous metrics. Now, it's not the same context that we do in development and social change, but the <coughs> techniques are very powerful. And the result of my, my kind of deep dive into customer satisfaction, which lasted about three years, was constituent voice methodology, which a 
friend of mine describes as the love child of participatory development and customer satisfaction. Um, and uh, to, just to finish with a story, I, one of the people that I spent some time with was a man named David Power. Some of you may have heard of J.D. Power and Associates, but it was the first of the full-time customer satisfaction firms. It's a big global firm now, and David Power was one of the founders of the industry. He's now in his late 70s, he lives in Los Angeles, and he loves to tell stories about the early days. So I went and sat at his feet and heard the stories. And one of the stories he told me really surprised me, and I think it's salutary for us in social change. I said, well, at least you were giving a new kind of data to these businessmen, and they were mostly men in that era, this was the 60s, early 60s, that, um, that were, were used to using data and really liked the data, and I bet they ate it up, I said, you know, and he said, well, no. Uh, in fact, I would have failed had it not been for the consumer rights movement that emerged in the late 50s, early 60s, and then in 1962, the Kennedy administration passed a series of legislation with the U.S. Congress, which basically established the modern statutory framework for consumer rights, which is now spread around the world. And he was said it was on the back of that social movement and that legal structure which the customer satisfaction industry was born. And that's very interesting for us to reflect on because there's nothing like that in our space. There is no rights of the beneficiaries of aid uh, thing. The closest thing I think we've got is the accountability and empowerment work that Nina mentioned in the context of citizen voice and citizen demand. But when you move into the work of nonprofits, uh, it's just not there, and, and foundations, which is our theme today, philanthropy. So where is that forcing mechanism for us in the philanthropy world? Thank you, Debbie. That's a good um, point to stop for the panel. I think for a bit I'd like to find out now if there are um, people in the audience who have used or are using beneficiary feedback, not necessarily constituent voice because as Nina's said, you know, it, it goes much more widely, but is there experience in the audience of trying to get the feedback feedback from um, beneficiaries and really using it to improve decisions?